Now, I don't want to overhype this book, but this is the best book that you have never heard of. And it's a book that I've read at least once or twice a year for the past nine years. With that said, hey beautiful people of the internet, my name is Ryan. This is Once a Runner, a novel that has, I'm not kidding, changed my life at least twice. Disclaimer, this review comes to you in three parts. One, the basics about the book. Two, my personal reaction to it. And three, should you buy slash read the book. Oh, and disclaimer number two, this book review is going to be nothing like any other book review that I have ever done or will ever do. So strap in. Let's do this. Part one, the basics about the book. Now, normally this is where I would talk about the summary of the book's plot, but this is going to be a different book review, and this book is just different. The story starts before the book does. In 1978, the year that this book was published, John L. Parker Jr. had spent the last seven or eight years living as an elite distance runner. He had run track and cross country on one of the best university teams in the nation, University of Florida, and then he had spent a few years running for one of the best track clubs in the nation. He ran and raced and trained alongside some of the fastest American distance runners at the time, and John L. Parker Jr. himself had run a 406 mile. And then he set out to write a book. What happened during those few crazy years is the story of how cult followings get built. Parker wrote this book and he sent it out to publishers, none of whom took the offer. And so with the stubbornness of a long distance runner, Parker set up his own publication company, set the type for the book himself and printed 5,000 copies. He dropped the book off at running stores and asked them to sell it. He sold the book out of the back of his freaking car at road races and slowly, very slowly, the book started to be talked about. Quentin Cassidy is a miler with some promise. He is a champ on the verge of making that jump to the pros. He, he has the chance one day, maybe if things go very well, of racing at the very top of the field. Once a Runner is the story of that year in Quentin Cassidy's life where he sets everything else aside and tries to make that jump. It's a story full of college hijinks, of southern culture, with some pretty scathing writing on the American issues of the time. But mostly it's the story of Cassidy, and of his good friend Meisner, who is a longer distance runner, and of his girlfriend Andrea, who doesn't quite understand what Cassidy is doing, and also of Bruce Denton, who is kind of Cassidy's coach, and also the older runner who has been there before. It's this insider-outsider story, the story of the loneliness that you can feel while sitting in a room full of people who don't understand. 30 years after Once a Runner was originally published and sold out of the back of a car, it went back to press, this time picked up by a huge publisher, by Scribner. Copies of that first edition regularly sell for over $200 these days. And the book is so well known among runners that John L. Parker Jr. recently returned to the world of Quentin Cassidy and wrote a sequel, and then last year wrote a prequel. The cult following is real and alive and well. Copies of the book get passed from high school teammate to high school teammate. Quotes from the book get printed and tacked to the doors or the walls of bedrooms and, and this one I'm speaking from experience on, entire chapters or passages of the book get memorized and then recited during the long, slow 18 milers out on the snow-filled country roads in February when even the snow plows haven't gotten to the roads yet. Not every runner or even every collegiate runner loves the book, but if you are competitive in the world of long distance running for any amount of time, you can't run from the conversations about this book. These days, people make fake movie trailers about Once a Runner, link in the description below, and people sign up for races all around the country using the name Quentin Cassidy, making it look like he's running in about 10 different races every weekend. I mean, for a few years there, my Twitter handle, at Miles of Trials, came from the dedication of this book. This book is for Jack Batchelor and Frank Shorter, old friends, great runners, in fond remembrance, fellows of many trials and many miles. If you couldn't tell by now, this is where the personal part comes in. Part two, my personal reactions to the book. Once a runner starts off with an epigraph, which is a quote by Frank Shorter, this famous runner. How did I know you ran the mile in 430 in high school? That's easy. Everyone ran the mile in 430 in high school. Now, I've never done this before, but for this review, I think it's important that I do. I am, or was, a 430 miler. Now, I am more of a Meisner type, that's Cassidy's best friend. Someone who runs the longer distances, like the 5K, the 8K, now the ultra marathon. And I've run myself some pretty good times at those distances, so don't write me off. So I am one of those 430 milers that the book talks about. But the important thing to establish in this part of the review is that that fictional creature of the four flat miler, that like 
unreachable myth of the miles of trials, that is something that I'm a little closer to than most people. I have lived once or twice and for different amounts of time something close to the lifestyle that Cassidy and his friends are living in the book. A teammate of mine in college, for instance, ran 402 for the mile at an indoor meet, and my very best friend, like one of the people who will stand up front with me as I get married someday, was a 407 miler. This is a guy who I ran 70 or 80 or 90 miles a week with, week after week, for four full years. He was my partner in crime as we went through the trials of miles, the miles of trials. What I'm saying is, is that I am no four flat miler. I never have been and I never will be, not by a long shot, but I have been lucky enough to be closer in terms of proximity to this than a lot of people, than most of the population. And I think that is a big reason why this book is so important to me. Okay, so, but what exactly is the appeal of a book like this one to the larger public, to people who are not me? It's a long list, but I think a number of factors have contributed to the kind of cult status of this book. First is that Cassidy is a miler. He runs the American distance, 1,609 point something meters. Two, there is a chapter in Once a Runner for almost every part of the years long process of becoming a distance runner. There's a chapter for night running, for morning runs, for running in the rain, for the especially terrible way that you feel after you've come off of a lot of weeks at way too much mileage. And even more specifically, there is one mind blowing chapter called the interval workout, which just, duh. Once a runner spends time on every part of the experience, and I think that that calls to people. Three, there is a specificity of language to this book. The feeling that someone is putting words to a thing that you have really only ever felt out there on the road, and that makes the book feel like home. And number four, I think that if you took away Quentin Cassidy, and you took away Southeastern University, and you took away all of the specifics about this book, you even took away the running part of this book, what you would be left with is the bare stripped down one mythical enduring question. What if I just spent a year or four years or eight years chasing that one wild dream that I have? So there's that. There's all of the logical and theoretical things that I can come up with if I think for long enough and hard enough on this topic. But there is also this. There's the story of how I read Once a Runner for the first time as a 13 or 14 year old and I realized that despite everything else, despite all of the other crap that gets in the way, if I were to pour myself for 4 or 8 or 12 years into this sport, that the sport would then pour itself back into me, that it would pay me back. The story of how I learned from this book, at least twice in my life so far, to surrender myself to a larger process, to allow myself to become passionate as hell about something. And the third and final parts of this book review, the part that really makes me sweat when I start to think about this book, should I buy and or read it? In a lot of ways, this review is going to be different than any other one that I've ever done. Like, for instance, when I think about other books that I unabashedly love, books like Ender's Game because I've read them the most times so far in my life, or books like Infinite Jest or Ulysses, which were so hard but such rewarding processes of getting through, or books like Looking for Alaska, which I just read in one emotional long roller coaster of a night that tore me up. When I think about those books, I love all of those books and they're special to me for very different reasons, but I don't think that a single one of them, for me anyways, is irreplaceable. And Once a Runner is irreplaceable. And on that note, I'm going to make this book review different. I'm not going to answer the third part for you. There are some really obvious paradoxes about this book, right? Like for instance, the fact that maybe 1% of 1% of the population knows what it's like to run a 430 mile, and this book disses even those people before the first page happens. The paradox of how this book so exactly describes one set of people and one set of actions to the point that it alienates most others. The paradox of trying to review a deeply personal book for the general public. For a general public who very well, if they read it, might hate this book. Yeah, nine to ten years later, I still don't know what to do with this book other than to just keep reading it. 
So the thesis version of this review, I think, is that once a runner has maybe about as much to say about our personal relationships with books as it does about running. And perhaps the biggest thing of all, the question that I have been walking myself around with this book, the question that I've been avoiding, am I too personally involved with this book to see it objectively at all? Is there any way that I can review a book like this with any attempt made at objectivity? Am I too close to this book to see it accurately? And I think that that is the stalemate that we're left with at the end of this review. I'm not going to answer that third part question for you. I think it's a book that can rock your world, that could change things for you massively, but I also know for a fact that this is not for everyone. Yeah. I think we'll leave it there. Alrighty, that is all that I've got for this video. I would absolutely love to hear if you have read this book down in the description below because I would guess that nobody who normally watches my videos has actually read it. But maybe I could be proven wrong. So anyways, let me know. Other than that, I am going to keep the videos coming uh, for Short Story Saturdays and on Mondays. So you're getting two videos a week for the rest of the year. If you did like this book review, there is a playlist down in the description below of all of the other books that I have reviewed. So you could definitely go check that out. And also there's a little red button down below, which I think if you hit that button, 2016 becomes less terrible. So maybe you should do that. Thank you all for sticking with me in this video, and I will see you guys very soon. Until then, best wishes. Hey, beautiful people of the internet. My name is Ryan, and happy Saturday. Happy short story Saturday, specifically, because today we're going to talk about Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf. Running to him was real. The way he did it, the realest thing he knew. It was all joy and woe, hard as diamond. It made him weary beyond comprehension but it also made him free. My annotation below that says, well, now I'm crying. I've forgotten how much this chapter means to me.